Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got some special guests in the building. Yes, indeed. Okay, Full yeah. force. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My Welcome. brothers. Good morning. Good morning. Introduce Good morning. yourselves for the people who don't know, man. Okay, I'm Paul Anthony. I'm Bo Legged Lou. And I'm B Fine. And I just want to say that uh, we're the three Full Force brothers, mm -hmm. but Full Force is actually six members. Uh, we have Baby Jerry, mm -hmm. Shy Shy, and Kurt TT. Right. And y'all are brothers and cousins. Brothers yes, and cousins. Right. Salute yes. to them, but we only uh, acknowledge the ones that were in house party. Okay, so <laughs> that's the full force I know. Okay, now let's start. Let's start from the beginning for people who don't know who Full Force is. Who is Full Force? Where are you guys from? And how did you create this group? Mm. Oh man, that's I mean, a we're, big we're, ass we're, question. I'm, I'm, I'm a size of a blue ticket. We're based uh, from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, Brooklyn all day, and um, Brooklyn. you know, Full Force started. Uh, I guess we was 10, 11, 12 years old, and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, our parents would wake us up routinely, you know, because in our family, singing was not an option. You'd wake us up, be on the train, all the way up to Harlem, get out of 125th Street. My father dropped the hat. We sing for hours, make enough money to either eat dinner that night or go to the Apollo. And that's how we started, you know. And uh, we just kept on grinding from the age of 11, 12. Well, basically, and nine. the three of us was. Yeah. Our father and our uncle Cito. They got mm -hmm. three of us as a group first and foremost. Right. Mm -hmm. And then that's when we connected later on with our three cousins right. to form full force. The right. ones that weren't in house party. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so was this a was this a natural talent that you guys had or was it something that you really had to Well a combination of both. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it started with me. Uh, one time my father was he was listening to me sing in the shower. I think I was like nine, mm -hmm. and he heard a natural vibrato well, he, he in my voice. He was singing in the tub. We didn't have a right, shower. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and he heard a natural vibrato. I was singing a Smokey Robinson song, and I was doing the false and the vibrato. And he said, he said, hey, Anthony got a voice, you know. And then uh, I would be singing on the street by myself, and then he eventually trained my brothers to join with me. Yeah, yeah. hell, it shouldn't just be you by yourself. And then my brother B, <laughs> my, bro my brother B fine actually was forced into it yeah. because he didn't really want to do it. And you got to remember, I was six years old. Mm -hmm. Right. I was six years old. I was the baby, you know, and I... I don't want to do that. I want to play. A, I want to yeah. be a baseball player. <laughs> yeah, no choice. I hated practicing. I had no choice. to whip my ass. The world was always like, sideways to me. I was always practicing like this and shit. And you <laughs> slap my head back right. up to sing. I, right, right, right. I hate it. I'm glad you yeah. did this thing. So y'all were athletes when y'all were younger. That, that explained the builds. Right? Uh, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, we was always athletic. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, our first baseball. our first uh, thing was baseball. baseball. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, you know we was in the junior league. B was in the minor league, the smaller league. But he was so good that he brought us. He brought up to our level, and that was one of the joys. My mom and dad first they came to a baseball game, and they see me in center field, blue in right field, a little bit in uh, left field. Yeah. What did your parents do for a living that they, you guys, came out like this? I'm just curious. Oh, oh man, at the time, my dad worked in a factory. Mm -hmm. You know, he worked in a factory, and my mom she worked as a social worker. You know, okay. later but I, on. But yeah. I think the key of what you're getting to is, is my father was a doo wop singer. Right. Right. That's how, That's it. you know, he was heavily into doo-wop. He's lived his dream through us. Was he, was he a doo-wop weightlifter singer, man? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I was in the gym early. <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 man. That was that was our thing, you know. You know, I feel wonderful that we are pretty much credited with being one of the first to bring in physical fitness and bodybuilding and training. For me, it was a way of life, you know. I started that, you know. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because even in house party, I'm like, are they? do they go to the school? Are they just some uh, older kids that's just <laughs> right. raising hell outside of Super the school? Super duper, duper, duper seniors. Yeah. yeah we yeah. got left back. Yeah, there, was a meme floating around, there was a meme floating around that says, house party tried to convince us that these three guys were 17-year-old high school. That's a fact. That was funny. Last week, and I seen it, and I was like, they were. Yeah. Like, that got really in. Like, I, like looking right, back at right, it, like, right, right. I mean, they, they in really high school and they don't play no football? Right. Come yeah, on, now. Right. Yeah, 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 we got yeah. left back 10 times. Ten times. Okay. So now let's talk about how the career started to really blossom and some of the people you work with early on. Mm. I well, think that, go ahead, tell them. Yeah, go ahead. Look. Well, you're going to do, you're going to do UTFO, but before UTFO, yeah, before we were even known as Full Force, we were working with Curtis Blow. Mm -hmm. Props to Curtis Blow, who we love. And um, one of the songs that we co-wrote with Curtis and performed on was basketball. Yeah. And this is before wow. we were known. First one. So after that was a uh, UTFO, which I have my friend up in heaven uh, from college, Steve Salem, uh, he's the one that encouraged us 
to produce and write for other people. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to do that. I just was like, just full force. I didn't give a shit about anybody else. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) thank God I was wrong. He said, you should write and produce for other people. And then if that happens, you guys will get a record deal of your own. Yeah. And that's exactly and, what happened. And that's happened. how we was one of the first to really get in hip hop. But if we need to really start from the beginning, I used to party at all the clubs all the time. Oh, here you we know, go. it was like Tuesday, Justine's, Wednesday, Kali Bryan, Thursday, uh, uh, Tribeca, Friday, Leviticus, Bonds International. And um, in there with no shirt on. Just a white <laughs> beard. Something like that. Something like that. And I, I went up to Harlem. This is before rap even came out. I went up to Harlem and I was uh, at Small's Paradise with Eddie Chiba. And I was like, yo, what is this? This thing is, what's this called? They said, yo, this is rapping. I said, yo, this is dope. Wow. So I came back to Brooklyn and I said to Lou and B and my cousins, hey, y'all, I had a dream last night, man. I came with the idea. I'm, I'm going to make up something. It's called rapping. <laughs> They're like, really? Yeah. And y'all going to be my crew. And we was his damn <laughs> yeah. crew. Yeah. So he made up rap. Like he made up rap. rap. <laughs> I'm going to call rapping. He called yeah. Rap. <laughs> and they said, yeah, dip, dip, dab, so socialized. And they finish it up. And one, then I think we I heard it. it. We heard it at a club in Harlem. Harlem World. Harlem World. And we heard it. I said, the oh. fuck are you didn't make up this shit. <laughs> 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 and he's even saying the dip, dip, die, socialized thing, too. You know? <laughs> so basically, so talking about UTFO, Paul. Yeah, beat, I was going to ask about UTFO. Yeah, 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 what happened is that yeah. um, Steve Salem, who's our, our partner and manager, yeah, he said that because we couldn't get a deal. Mm-hmm. He said, you guys should get into production. And Lou hated that idea. I loved it. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. So the deal is, long story short, is um, I found this kid, this kid who danced and pop named Kango, mm-hmm. you know, and then um, he was trying to rap to my girlfriend. I really went up to school, school. to kick his ass. Right. Wingate, wingate <laughs> high. Kick, really kick, kick his fucking ass. Kick his fucking ass. Dancing so good and everything, you know. Um, he brought in his, his partner, Doc, and then there's EMD and Mixmaster Ice, and, you know, I had this idea uh, to do a song named Roxanne. Mm-hmm. And, like, people were asking, why Roxanne? I said, for real? It's because the name is kind of uncommon to me. Right. You know, I don't. I know tons of Sharons, but I know a lot of Roxanne's. And plus, the police did it, and that was my only reason. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's crazy that because it. y'all started wow. all kind of Roxanne beefs and yeah, sure, it yeah, started. We had no it idea. And that's a, a crazy rappers. feeling yeah. to have the success when you don't know successful. I'm walking downtown Brooklyn, and I see somebody at the time with the boombox, and it's blasting, and girls are running behind right. them just to hear it, and I'm like, oh shit, that's what I just did. That beat I did it with Kango and Doc in the studio, and. And man, there was no automation. There was like 10 hands on the board with Jerry and Kurt and everybody. Oh, you got the part. You got to mute it when the bass come in there. Yeah. When the bass starts scratching, then that's Three beats on history. Yeah, Three yeah. beats on record. And after that, of course, Roxanne's Revenge. Roxanne's then we, Doctor. we Then Roxanne's Doctor. Then we jumped on our own bandwagon. We created the real Roxanne. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and then um, and I feel, and Shantae, I, I, Roxanne, Roxanne, yeah, yeah. Shantae. Sparky D. Roxanne we, Shantae was the we first take pride in the first she did. It was Roxanne Roxanne's Shantae, Revenge. and then they said there was a real Sparky Roxanne. D, yeah, I'm confused about that. So how many Roxanne's were there? Over 30. There's Roxanne's godmother. There was Roxanne. Oh, that's the what? records, but she's talking about she's like, talking about Roxanne. Oh, well, there was oh. A, we had the real Roxanne, mm-hmm. okay? And it's so funny because I was working at a social worker. I was a social worker, and there was this young lady. She was Puerto Rican, but she had a little a lot of attitude. And I just looked at her and I said, "You know what? You look like you look like my real Roxanne." And she looked at me. Who the hell are you talking to? I said, oh, yeah, this is it. This is the one right here. And her name is Joanne yeah, Martinez. Before before Joanne Martinez, there was Elise Jack, who was the one on the record, Okay. Uh, the real Roxanne. And then we worked with Joanne, who was the one in the video, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. with UTF. So we feel good that we opened up the doors for a lot of female rappers. You know, we helped usher that in, you know? Right. Sparky D don't get a lot of credit. I know. Yeah, she don't get the credit she yeah. deserves. Sparky D wonderful, is dope. I love queen. Sparky D, and she definitely was part of the whole Roxanne scenario. Because she came out with Sparky's back, mm-hmm. yep. I think, after Roxanne's yeah, Revenge. Yeah, right. Right. She's from the Bronx, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And there was Bronx friction back D. then, but now Shantae, that's her sister. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that, yeah it, was, it, was, it was good. It was How did y'all get in the house party movie? All right, let's see. Did, did we y'all was, dug your way in? Did y'all threw <laughs> No, you know, yeah, but it's funny. Uh, we, we was uh, I was writing. I was home writing. I got a phone call from um, a guy who worked with us named Robert Ford Jr. And he said, "Paul, I got a friend of mine, and uh, he's been working on this script. And uh, you know, in the script it says the bullies were muscle bound, jerry curl dudes that looked like full force." That was in the script. That was in the script. So yeah. he said to Reggie Hudlin, who created, well, <laughs> I know Full Force, why don't you call him? So I'm here writing, and, and Lou, he always coined the phrase, you never know. So we're always open-minded to everything. I got a phone call and said, hey, man, my name is Reggie Hudlin, and I came with this idea called House Party, and 
are the guys are Jericho Muscle Bound guys and <laughs> maybe shout to you. And I said, Hey, we'll send it over. You never know. So he sent it over and I read some of it and I do what I normally do with stuff like that. Cause when we were younger, Lou was always in the can of projectors and doing shows for the family. Yeah, so, so I did what I always do. I said, Hey Lou, I'm going to the gym, read this <laughs> and uh, go. So anyway, so what happened is that with the script, we had to go down and sort of audition the Hudlin brothers, which is Reggie Hudlin and Warrington Hudlin, his brother who produced it. Reggie, of course, was the director. And they just wanted to know if we can act, if the three of us had chemistry. And we did some improvisations there and everything. We got the gig like just like that. We went out to L.A. and we did a table read with Martin Lawrence, Tisha Campbell, A.J. Family. Johnson, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Dowdchill Mitchell, everybody. You know, even um, George Clinton, who paid the old school so as we're reading this, we're doing the table read. When we go back to our hotel, right. I tell my brothers, I'm like, yo, guys, I, I don't like our part. Our parts are so bland. And it's just like, we're just like bullies with no personality. Right. Yeah. Which my brothers in Crush Groove, they played bullies mm -hmm. with yeah, no personality. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. So yeah. I said, I said, listen, originally B's name was supposed to be Pee Wee. I said, B, we're going to switch. I'm smaller than both y'all. I'll be Pee Wee. You're Zilla. Paul is stabbed, and let me change up some of this shit. So I came up and I said, "Now I'm going to talk like this throughout the whole movie." You know, and they thought I was crazy <laughs> at first. Was oh, he was a pain in the ass with that man. Because yeah. I kept, I kept like this throughout We're the whole lunch, thing. He's still doing this thing. <laughs> so, so what happened is that I changed up the lines of all the Reggie stuff. Yeah, we didn't change I came every up line. with "kick your fucking ass." I said, I, "If I say that enough times, it might be a catchphrase." You know. Right. And then it's I like came up with uh, well, "I smell, I smell, I you? smell pussy." Because we used to say that all the time at the <laughs> BRE and <laughs> concerts and stuff. Well, yeah. never said Did y'all really smell pussy, or was y'all just being? Yeah. You know, no. Insulting the guys. Just a insulting. little both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but who gonna say something bad? You see the smell, smell, And the crazy thing about it is because for for me doing the kick your freaking ass thing, I got it from like not Joe Pesci, but Joe Pesci used to say something in Lethal Weapon okay. Two. Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. And he made that like sort of a thing. Yeah, so I said, let me make a sort of a theme, mm -hmm. and it stuck. So what we did is we performed it in our trailer. For the Hudlin brothers, I said, listen, if y'all don't like it, then we'll go back to what's there. And then as soon as they saw us do it, they said, keep it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after that, every time we changed up every, every shit time. of ours yeah. in there. Every line. You know? And, yeah. and both of those became catchphrases. G yeah. Unit turned it into a record later on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and House Party will be 30 years old on this March year. 9th. Yeah. Yeah. 30 years. We're blessed. Yeah. Celebration. Did, ti did time fly? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it yeah. did. Yeah, it's a yeah, good thing blessed. that we, you know, I was 12 when we first did the first time. <laughs> <laughs> But besides all that, though, and House Party, you guys have worked with so many legendary artists. Yeah. yeah. So I want people to know about that part Absolutely. as well. So let's well, talk about some of the most... The legendary? Uh, well, before yeah. we mention yeah. the, the other groups, we have to mention it. And, um, after, we did UTF, after we did UTFO, we needed to get into the mainstream with music. And then... Lisa Lisa was born. You know, I love Lisa Lisa growing up. Yeah. Everybody. Because that what was happens is that my girl. I, I grew up in a neighborhood <laughs> where at a school at Wingate High School where there was a lot of um Hispanic brothers and sisters playing handball mm -hmm. and I would tease them saying, Yeah, man, yeah, yeah, you know you like Menudo. Mm -hmm. They didn't like Menudo. That was for their kids. <laughs> their kids' sisters and stuff like that. And I would tease them. And I thought, Yeah, we should have a Spanish girl who captures that essence of New York the way I know it. And I don't know Menudo. I didn't hang with kids that were like Menudo. Right. They were like, you know, like Fat Joe, like Lisa, that that whole style. So we auditioned a girl and Lisa was born. Yeah, Lisa. Yeah, Lisa. Called Lisa, Lisa, Lisa. Lisa. Two guys Lisa, putting the, Cult Jam. Michael Hughes uh, from Cult Jam, he used to run the streets with us putting yeah, up flyers Michael and posters. Smart. Right, So right. he brought Lisa to us. And even though B wanted a Spanish girl right from the jump, mm -hmm. I tried to sneak in a friend of mine, Cheryl Pepsi Riley, who we wrote and produced Thanks for My Child mm -hmm. for. I tried to sneak her in there to do I Wonder If I Take You Home. Uh, I don't think she liked the song or either she said she was in another group, but right. B wasn't having it regardless. No, right. It had to be that. Spanish. Yeah. Right. And Lisa became like the first Hispanic to do yeah, there was nobody. hip hop, yeah, pop, people dance. People don't that. She did club music. She yeah, did, yeah. nobody was doing that. She yeah. was before Gloria Estevan. And the thing about it is when yeah, our parents taught us what because when we came in the business, we came as business minded because we managed Lisa, we produced, we wrote, you know, we did the publishing. And so there was always several revenue streams. We have to have that. But that opened the doors up for a lot of things. She became the number one artist in the world. Mm -hmm. And when you speak of legendary artists, getting back to what you asked, the mm -hmm. first person that comes to town is James Brown, the Godfather. We're the only ones to write and produce an entire album for the Godfather of Soul. God damn. I think people yeah. don't yeah. know. Yeah. And, 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 and James like Brown's yeah. last two top ten records, which was I'm Real 
and Static, Static yeah. was written and produced by Full Force, and we had a great time in the studio Yo, that was, with that him. Was, I had a force feed in Static, hell. though. I had a force feed in Static. That was hell? Why yeah. was that? Yeah. That was... Yo, you had like Rolling Stone magazine showing up, because that was the time when he was like kind of bugging out. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things going on in his life, yeah. and you know, him shooting on the lawn, and, and we were acting like, no, everything's cool, everything's cool. It's cool. But, <laughs> yo, there was times when he was singing, and there he is in the studio, and you had to catch him when you catch him. You know, right. he would make you put up cue cards yeah. to do the lyrics and stuff. And one time, he just dropped into a full split and we're like, where the hell did he go? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Right, right, where did he go? Mr. Yeah. Brown. Was, and, then the, and then the photographer said, Mr. Brown, can you do that again? No, you should have did it when I did it. Yeah. And then he just walked walked off. And, but we're talking legend. I mean, he he came by himself, walked off the elevator. They said, yo, Paul, you go meet him. And I, I'll never forget the day he walked off. It was almost like slow motion. I see him coming towards me. He had a three-piece blue pinstripe double-breasted suit with cuffs. He had brown patent leather horse uh, shoes with the horseshoe in the front of it. He had a multicolored ascot. He had a full-length fur coat. He had black motorcycle glasses and had pink, pink glasses. And I'll never forget, um, I said, Mr. Brown, everyone from Michael Jackson to Prince has lifted something from you. That's All I fact. ask is that you trust us the way we trust you, and we're gonna put you <clears throat> where we belong. So after talking for a little while, he said, "Well, he said, um, <clears throat> look at I love you. I love you like my sons. We're gonna do it like this. Yeah, I'm gonna, we're gonna try to do it. Yeah, and we're gonna skip. I said, thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Brown. Brown. Thank right. you so much. <laughs> and we had to call him Mr. Brown. Yeah, he, because before right. we was hearing rumors that he's like mean in the studio and everything like yeah. that. So I called up Dan Hartman, who had did Living in America, and he just and I said, yeah, we getting ready to work with Mr. Brown with, with James Brown. Well, first of all, you don't call him James. You yeah, call him Mr. Mr. Brown." So we That's respect we call him right out the, right out the door, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. Um, Reverend Al Sharpton used to come in, into the studio every now and then, and whenever Check he walked in, we said, okay, we're gonna have to probably yeah. have an hour break yeah. so he could talk to Mr. Brown. That was his disciple. And, um, yeah, Other yeah, legends yeah. Uh, that I enjoyed, we worked with the great Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was that was an interesting project Patty, too. We got yeah. stories. P the Patty wonderful LaBelle, Patty Labelle, our girl Patty. We did some wonderful things with Patty. And that was a Bob Dylan story. Mm. Oh man, okay, you my favorite, that, my favorite Bob, Bob Dylan, Dylan story, yeah. yeah, yeah. At the time, Mar uh, Bob Dylan was being produced by Mark Knopfler of the Dire Straits, and they was having some serious friction. It was all recording at Power Station Studios, and at that time, Mark had to go on tour, so Bob, he heard us singing in the hallway, because that's how my father trains us, just always go in the hallway and sing. So we, so he heard us, and we just heard a voice from upstairs saying, hey, you guys sound pretty good down there. I said, okay, well, thank you. <laughs> and then he came walking down to see us, and we were like, you know, it's like, wow, Bob Dylan. So he got, we got a phone call. Listen, I want you to come in and do some harmonies. Uh, so we, like, ran. You know, we came in and uh, we did two songs. One is called Death Is Not The End and Tell Me Why. <clears throat> but um, this particular session, we're in there recording, doing vocals with Bob Dylan. And he's got his feet up on the console playing guitar. And they had to mic him because he didn't want to move. He didn't want to break up the ambience of where he was sitting. So they had to come out and mic him around where he was sitting. And he's playing this song, and with death, death is not the end. And didn't understand why, but the man was ahead of his time. Now there was a listening session. So we had the great Bill Graham, one of the greatest promoters of all time, uh, Walter Yentikoff, the chairman at the time of uh, what was CBS Records at the time, and uh, Don DeVito, executive vice president. And Bob was playing some songs. Everybody in the room was like, oh, we love it, Bob, you're a genius. Everybody's excited. My brother B is like, I don't like that song, Bob. Yeah. Man, all heads turned like, whoo, whoo. <laughs> yeah, they wanted to kill us. What's the answer? Because like, what? He's like, nah, I just don't hear it. I mean, we developed a relationship with him. Bob looked at B. He looked around the room. He said, you know, I don't like this song either, B. Thank you so much. You know? For not being yeah. a yes man. That so was just straight up. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was real. And then we took pictures together. But that was one Bob experience. Yeah. Did you guys have your business together, like, from the beginning? Or were there some things that you had to go through that were hard lessons? Oh, we went through. We went through. We and, went you know, through. we're just starting. So, you know, mm -hmm. we just starting in the business so we had our share of making mistakes oh, and our share of rapage and oh, getting absolutely. and getting jerked <laughs> and absolutely. we is it's all over but that's how yeah. you just live and you learn as you're growing up in this business the thing about it is then you have your slow periods and for us when we did have our slow periods even after producing and working with so many people um 
such as like um, we 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 decided to like, hey man, there's six members because we split everything six ways. Wow. Yeah. Still to this day, even writing, all about you know, songwriting, we all wrote hits separately. E- but uh, right, even if two force. people write a song or three people, it always force. say written and produced by full force. As we got older, Why we started. So hard B like look that. like he regrets <laughs> that yeah, to this yeah. day. Right, right. I got <laughs> voted out of that one. <laughs> okay, yeah, that one. <laughs> I wasn't down with the whole democracy thing. I was like, no, yeah. but listen, we're yeah. brothers and cousins. I mean, listen, I wasn't down with when we wrote when we wrote when we one of our biggest records that we've ever written was for the Backstreet Boys called All I Have to Give and that was the brainchild of Baby Jerry. Right. Yeah. So imagine if that money just went to Baby Jerry. Then how would you feel? No, no, not all the money. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, just just mine. I'm not cool with that because I did a bunch more of the stuff. That's why I say that. Yeah. You know? We all had our shares of hits. You know, I wrote right. Head to Toe, B wrote A Wonderful Take You Home, Jerry wrote that, we wrote Thanks to My Child. Okay. We all wrote some things well, but so in the end, you know, we shared it. One shit. for all and all for one. Yeah, but y'all yeah. still get publishing checks to this day. Yes, yeah. Still to this day. Yeah, still split by six. Yes. yes. And y'all were the last right. American producers <laughs> to work with. <laughs> y'all, y'all the last American producers to work with Selena too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah that you was, know, that that was amazing. I never forget. I mean, we. Uh, you know. I mean. <sighs> Yeah, we had to go out to Corpus Christi, so we stayed in the compound. And they would take a break from recording, because for them, touring was the first option. That was the first thing. So we took a break, you know, we came back, and couldn't believe we got a phone call that, you know, she was held, and we was, like, blown away because we didn't finish. So, you know, they said, A.B. called, and her brother said, hey, man, we want to finish the album. We still want to finish the album. So we went back out there, and now if you see, you see... Selena featuring Full Force because we wrote a song called Missing My Baby Mm -hmm. so I made up a bunch of different vocals and did it but that blew our mind because once again even though Selena was a star they shared everything five ways they split everything because that was was family now who you working with now you guys still what kind of spirit was Selena Oh, you, I mean, her energy? Yeah. Come sure on, it's is. pure. Like, what you see is what you get. She was kind of like Lou. She was yeah. a big prankster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, she was... And, and you know, when we saw her, when Lou saw her, she was doing some of the songs that we wrote for Samantha Fox and Lisa Lisa. No, she used yep, to do right, that when, right. when her band, before, sure, she, yeah, before yeah. she made it big, she right, used to do some so of the songs that we you wrote guys, for that. You did Samantha Fox? Yeah. 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 I want to have some fun. Naughty Girls need her, too. We wrote and produced that. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. I was like, listen, I, so it's hard for me to put it together because you know when you're young, you just hear music and you sure. never think about where it came from right. sure, sure, or sure. who wrote it. Like I always knew Full Force, but hearing you guys talk about all the legendary yeah. artists yeah. that you work with and all the, the hit songs you had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a whole I mean, sometimes we lose sight of it. I know sometimes I lose sight of it until like, you know, you go somewhere and like somebody like Timbaland or Pharrell or like T-Pain, right. they see us and they go like, yo, and I'm just so honored by these yeah. type of things. I yeah. never take any of this for granted. Like, like being right here and watching you guys, because I watch all of you guys. Stop. Yeah, you guys are great. You know, so I really... Yeah. Yo, we yeah. don't split things three ways. I got it. I don't want to say that. We don't split things three ways. It's good for your show, man. Yeah. But, but it's funny you said that a lot of people don't know the things we did. A lot of right. people don't know that we were the first ones to bring the world Nicki Minaj, mm-hmm. you know, we were about that. that first. Yeah, how was that? Yeah, well, Lou, you want to talk well, about we, Well, what happened is that my 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 son, Lou Star, he was putting together a group called the Hood Stars. He oh, put it, yeah. He, he, put mm-hmm. it, he put it together, and what happened is a friend of mine named Neil Grant took me over to a studio with this brother named Boz, and Neil says, Lou, you got to hear this girl, you know? And I went to the studio in Brooklyn, and I heard Nikki's voice, and I immediately said, she is dope. So I hooked up and met with Nikki, and besides, and besides Nikki just rapping, she even sang me a gospel song. Mm-hmm. And she was still mm-hmm. doing, and even before she made it big, she was doing all the crazy voices and everything mm-hmm. way before that as well. Mm-hmm. And then uh, my son, my son Lustar said, yo, dad, she's dope. They formed um, the Hood Stars mm-hmm. with 7-Up. Uh, my son Lou Star, Nikki, and my son's at the time best friend Safari. Safari. Mm-hmm. Right. So we all brought together, and it all happened in our uh, in my yeah. Brooklyn apartment. Oh, yeah. Actually, yeah. N- Nikki didn't want Safari in the group. Mm-hmm. <laughs> smart. Remember that. Yeah. She was smart. Yeah, she, she, she didn't want him in the group. But we wanted him in the group because Safari had the you know that hype man personality. <laughs> she she was smart, the group, yeah. You know, but. <laughs> But they yeah. all they all yeah. went together, and the bottom line is that we tried to to get them a deal as, uh, together. It was just hard, and we took them to, to places, Def yeah. Jam and Ma- you know. But there's uh, Magic. there's but, a lesson in that, though. No, go ahead. But but the but the bottom line is then we paired off, and then we started work with Nikki Solo and working with her as well, and taking her different places. And yeah. uh, you know, certain people. I remember when we took her to Tai Tai, 
with Def Jam, oh. she, he didn't really hear it, you know. Oh. But the, and then one place we went to Warner Brothers, Kevin Lyles. Mm-hmm. I, went with, Kevin I, went, I went with Nikki, and Kevin says, I love the group, but it's that girl, it's that girl. Right. But the thing about it is that they wanted to have a ghostwriter for Nikki. Gene Nelson like, said that. Right, Gene Nelson so, at the no, time wanted Jules Santana to write for her. And she refused. Right. And at that time, out. we didn't even get Damn the Warner Gene. Brothers deal. Right. <laughs> Damn wow. Gene. But yeah. I think Gene is working with Nikki now, I yeah, think. Yeah, but yeah, before, right. team, right. but yeah, before yeah, I didn't. Yeah. And Nikki didn't want to because Nikki always had a thing about writing, home, writing so. her own shit. And that yeah. was impressive to me with Nikki because let me tell you, at that time, yo, hungry. Right. Mm-hmm. Real hungry. And even with that, and she had a little crush on Jules. Right. Even with that, Nikki was like, "I don't care, B. I don't care. I write my own rhymes. Damn mm-hmm. that." Right. And she, oh, she's serious about that because yeah. she broke she's serious and hungry. About that. Right from mm-hmm. jump. Mm-hmm. From the jump. That's oh, why you, you got, get so uh, mad. She would be so mad for people to say she don't write her own rhymes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to totally salute, salute her for that. No, 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 no. What, what did she say about not having Safari in the group? Though? What was her reasoning? <laughs> That's what you she go thought he was corny. Okay, but smart. No, but, that was <laughs> but we thought we thought he was talented. I mean, my, bro, my my son was like, I don't know, but because Safari was his friend, <laughs> he got a pass, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. And the Seven Up definitely, fuck that. He didn't want him, but we, you know, we you know, we're, we're, team, we're team oriented. <laughs> we we, team, we right. teamed it, and it was, you know, still a positive. Yeah, scenario. You know, I'm sorry. And, and check this out: when we was working with Nikki, we went, as she as she was an unknown. We was in the other studio, you know, working with Little Kim yeah, on her Kim, album. Yeah. Wow. Um, what yeah. is it, La Bella Mafia? Yeah, that was Bella Mafia. We, we, yeah, we, we uh, co wrote and produced on that too. Yeah. So we was working with, with uh, Kim. But but Nikki always respected the female rappers. I feel good that we were on the crest, on the crest of a lot of first things. Now, like what, what other artists? What other artists did you well, work Because, I mean, I mean you, you think about it, it's through all spectrums from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from the beginning to Kim to Nikki, who who else did that? y'all work with that well, people wouldn't know? Well, we had uh, Justin, know, say. Justin Timberlake and Insync, yeah, Insync, yeah, uh, Britney Spears, in. LFO. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Britney Spears G- before she was signed. She oh yeah, she crashed deal. in our Brooklyn basement for weeks, bringing out yeah. the the voice Yo, she, and the she essence had some curry of her. Curry chicken, peas and rice from the corner. She yeah. was like, what? Is this? <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. We always made the joke and said, yeah. Yeah, that's how she got that ass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's how she got that ass. That's the I'm going to be honest with you. We got to yeah. revise history, man, because I'm trying to figure out why Full Force don't get mentioned with the greatest production. I know, world. man. I know. I know. You talk to the greatest producers, they will say us immediately. You like know Nile I mean? Rodgers. I see you guys work with Nile Rodgers, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that Nile is one of the first guys that impacted my life. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say that because when I was in college... Um, I literally stalked him. They were the hottest group in the world. Sheik. And Sheik. I stalked him. I found out where he lived. Damn I it. know he recorded. He would come out of Lincoln Tower Plaza. Uh, he would see our picture on his car. Yeah. Before, before we there. were known. Yeah, He'd be at the know. studio doing, um, and he was things. you couldn't get in. Right. But I always find a way in. And he's doing, working with Sister, Sister Sledge, Sledge. And I'm over there, and he's like dancing. He's just sort of glancing at me. And I'm like, go there, big nigga. How you again. doing? Right, yeah. right, right. Big nigga, follow and, me. And, <laughs> yeah, so I stalked him, and he did one thing that that changed uh, everything uh, to me. He, um, man. one day I got home from college, and my mom said, "Anthony got a call from somebody." I said, "Really? Somebody named Nile or Ryle or Ryle?" And I dropped my bag. I said, "What?" I said, "Mom, what did he say?" He said, um, "Miss George, tell your son that first of all." I really respect him for being forceful and everything. Right now, we're so busy. We don't have time to work with this group. It's a great name in full force. That's great. But tell him, don't stop what he's doing. And I just cried because Translation? I, I felt... You, you yeah. tell that nigga, no. leave me the fuck alone? Right, right, right. <laughs> but my, my interpretation was... My inter- and he did it nicely. Yeah. He's, he's always been that way. But my interpretation is, he made a phone call, so he put his energy in my home, right, spoke right. to my matriarch. Right. So for me, success was preeminent. And that's I said... Right. That's how, and that's how I read it. it so now we see out. each other now, and he said, "Damn, boy, I fucked up." <laughs> you know? the but ball we're good friends that. now. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. we both been, we're both cancer champions, and and a lot of the little things, man. So let's it's all good. T- let's talk about that. Let's talk about the Paul Anthony Foundation. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the Paul Anthony Foundation. Uh, the phrase I, I use is, uh, "The cancer survivor walks the earth, but the cancer champion conquers the world." And you know, I started the foundation to to build awareness uh, in terms of being proactive with our health, particularly our men, because we're the endangered species. So I coined the phrase "proactivation times integration equals eradication." You know, if we integrate all the things that are available to us, we can eradicate disease. And it was shocking because in 2006, when I, I mean, when I saw the lump in my neck, I literally was squatting like 405 for like 10, 15 reps. And I looked in it and I said, "What is this? I didn't feel it." And my man said, 
Colin Bergan, he said, Paul, yo, you check that out. So I went in, I got an FNA, a fine needle aspiration. They drew us some fluid out of it. And it said, um, seemed to be consistent with mantle cell lymphoma. Mm. So I didn't know what that was. I heard the word lymphoma. And then when I did a biopsy, and you look up that, the two first words I saw was fatal and non-curable. And Lou was there. So the first thing that I said was, wow. And then about 30 seconds after that, I said, it just came, I said, I ain't changing shit. And what I meant was my constitution, my belief, because I've always been an advocate of the mind, body, and spirit connection before that. And that's how you know God gave his toughest battles to his toughest warriors. Because I was, I'm, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm equipped for this, you know? And um, it was, it was mind blowing because I've inspired so many pro athletes mm-hmm. and entertainers over the years. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a trip. You know, we went on, me and my brothers, we literally ran on tour because I was in the third, going into the fourth stage. So we went to so many different hospitals, sack and hack and sack and everyone. And then mm-hmm. one of the last places we went to was uh, Memorial Stone Kettering. And um, it wasn't just Lou. I was there. No, too. I said my brothers. OK, he said brothers. Ahead. I said brothers. All right. No, of course you were. <laughs> yeah, no, we all walked through fire Show together. My love light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget, man, when uh, when the doctor came out and I'm going to let you take it. When the doctor came out, he introduced himself <laughs> to us and he said, oh, how you doing? My name is Dr. Hamlin, Dr. Paul Anthony Hamlin. Mm. And I was like. Mm-hmm. Another sign. I looked around the room and I said, thank you. And I said to him, I said, all my life I've been on Paul Anthony. I said, so I'm going to keep on betting on Paul Anthony. Mm-hmm. And that's the one of the main reasons why I chose Memorial Stone Kettering. And, and, and we got to give yeah. a shout out also to TV One's Unsung because they profiled yeah. us. Kathy uh, Hughes, my uh, girl. They, they profiled us on, on that talking about Paul's scenario. After that Unsung episode finished, Paul's cancer had came back. Mm. And when Paul was really fighting for his life, he needed a but, bone marrow... No, I was gonna say during the first cancer, I would you'll see pictures of me training in my room. You know, right. anytime there was a uh, a new chemo cocktail I had to go through, I would prepare for it. Did some more reps, mm-hmm. did some more training, did some more things, and you know you have to walk around like twelve laps around very slowly. You know, with the smog and everybody's walking slowly. Man, I had my headband, my gym gloves. I took that yellow smoke tied around my neck like Superman and I'm rocking to my music and they're saying yo you, you're supposed to do 12 why are you doing 20 laps I said because I've never been ordinary and I said the person that does extra is what makes them extraordinary That's right. so I just manipulate the situation and just mm-hmm. do more and go more and, and do more and then when it came back you know that one, one of the first things the doctor did is tested both of my brothers right. to see who would be a match. I, I thought it was going to be me. Right. We, we right. Because me and we both work out. Oh. It was Lou, right? Like, he had my 10 for 10 donor match. And what happened Lou. is that when Paul was fighting for his life, at the time they said, okay, we got we to gotta do it. So Paul was telling the doctor, um, we're getting ready to do the bone marrow stem cell transplant. So Paul was telling the doctor, what should I do? Should I change my way of yeah, eating? Should funny. I train? And he told Paul, just be good to Lou. Be good to Lou. <laughs> so, so the bottom line is that what happens yeah. is that when so, I went in, because I had to be home taking uh, nip, Nupogen, uh shots, right. you know, injection shots twice a day for two weeks to harvest my stem cells to prepare for Paul. As Paul was in the uh, in his room just getting right. weaker and weaker with his immune system going mm-hmm. low. And mm-hmm. I remember before we had to do the transplant, Paul actually told me, and this is no lie. He says, yo, Lou, man, please, before... Please just don't get hit by a car and fuck right. everything don't up. Mess nothing up. He told me that. <laughs> I got things to do. Don't so mess so up. what happened is that the nurses told me that, so listen, things could happen to you too. Like I could bleed inside and stuff could happen to me doing it. He said, mm-hmm. do you still want to do it? And I said, of course I do. I would die for my brothers. I would right. die for my family. We're all like that. And, yeah. and, and, and the thing about it is that they said, mm-hmm. your brother needs uh, six million stem cells to survive. Mm-hmm. If we don't get enough, we're going to take a catheter to your chest and try to draw out as much as we can. Right. And um, what happened is that, you know, I did my thing. And to my surprise and all this surprise, instead of giving Paul six million stem cells, I was able to give him nine million stem okay. cells yeah. to help save Just his like life. That. And here's yeah. the crazy thing with the whole stem cells thing. My mm-hmm. thing is that I'm dealing with a, a disease myself called retinitis mm-hmm. pigmentosa which leads to blindness. There's no cure right now. And, I, and I'm and i staying proactive because I'm following my brother Paul. Because even though when Paul was in the in the hospital fighting for his life and doing chemo, Paul would still be on the phones doing business. So I mm. take that incentive from Paul. He never like, I can't do it. He was still yeah, doing that, business, that, business as that, usual. That, that always amazed me. And I just stay that way. Yeah. So even though I say to myself, fuck, man, I wish you had a stem cell for my fucking eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. But um, well, we all support one another. No, I was going to say with Paul, the thing that always... 
impressed me with Paul because I'm very much like the three brothers were different in our personality. Lou was like very loving the world. Paul's like loving the loving, but if I can't love you, fuck it. I'm fuck it. You know, so the deal is, <laughs> I, I, I like, I, I looked at Paul and I would just look at him from a distance and it's amazing to see somebody that is who they say they are. Paul would say things like this, like, oh man, I have something that's supposed to happen, I'd rather happen to me than y'all because I'm built for this. He would say stuff before things even happened. Right. And when it happened, I remember the doctor, one of the doctors in NYU said, you know, we'd probably give you three to four years to live. And Paul said, I think I could write a couple of his songs in three years. How do you say oh shit like gosh. that? You know, but he was always that positive mindset, yep. doing chin-ups on the door. And I'm like looking at him like, Damn. Even when the doctors tell him, don't do it, you know? No, but the mindset, though, because right. it, it was amazing to see that you don't know who you are until adversity tests your ass for real. Mm -hmm. You right. really don't know. You can say, well, I'm the, the. You don't know shit right. until it happens. It was amazing to see that he is who he said he was, right. you know? And Bolega yeah. Lou, on your YouTube channel, you talked about the eye condition. What is that? How do you, what is, how did that even start? Man, it's yeah. like one, it's like one of those, it's like one of those rare things it's uh, uh it's just one of those diseases like tunnel vision right like right now i have no peripheral vision that way or up way i bumped into so much shit and yeah. bumped into things and knocked down little kids because i don't look down so what it does is like one of these things so the thing about it is you just got to stay proactive i got to give a shout out to uh dr bass who who um had found out what I had, and then Dr. Uh, Rosenfarb as well, who does uh, alternative medicine. So I just don't stick with the medical medicine, because medical, they don't really give you a keep hope alive speech. Dr. Rosenfarb gives that keep hope alive speech, mm -hmm. because it's not just about the disease in the eyes, it's also about stuff around you. You gotta eat right, mm -hmm. and stress. He says, Lou, just mm -hmm. try not to stress a lot, mm -hmm. because stress really fucks up a lot of things that you're going oh, through. Absolutely. So I'm just staying positive and proactive, and um, yeah. Because I, I want to see forever, you know? And then, so now, basically, you know, through the Paul Anthony Cancer Foundation, I use the music to feed the purpose, you know? Mm -hmm. Anytime we're doing a show or anything, you know, my brothers may not know what may come out of my mouth, or sometimes I don't know. You know it's how he instructs me. But now it's touching people and, and not only cancer, but health, nutrition, staying strong before things right. happen, you know? So, right. How, yeah. how have your various health issues strengthened your bond as a, as a group? Well, brothers. Uh, and brothers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it brought us closer together if possible because we was always close, but we galvanized definitely. I mean, every transplant, I mean, every infusion, every blood work, every needle, you know, Lou came with me to Sloan Kettering. And, you know, much of the tribute goes to our, par our parents and God because if B would have been in 10 for 10, then he would have did it. Right. And I would have did it. You know, we right. all did yeah. that. So it just brought us closer together and make you aware that life life is short and tomorrow's not promised. So in, in, always move through. through in right my health God. situation, I wasn't even talking about mm -hmm. it. I didn't care. I just love giving and just supporting everybody else. But my friend Regina Hall and uh, my other friend Donna Knight, they were the ones that pushed me to talk about it. And mm -hmm. so she... Regina's like president of my uh, foundation nice. called Hope with a Vision, V I Z I O. Yeah. And we're going to do some special and, things and a for, lot both, of, for, both, for both foundations, and, you and, know? And a lot of other folks that's, that's visually impaired, like Wonder Mike from Sugar Hill Gang, you know what I mean? He has, doesn't have vision in one of his eyes. Dr. Dre, of course, who's a dear, very dear friend of mine. Dr. Dre from Dr. Dre and Ed Lover. Yeah, how's he doing? He, he's yeah, doing yeah. good. He's very positive, you know? He d doesn't have a sight. And you, of course, you guys heard the RB group Surface. Mm -hmm. Well, David Pitt Conley, who's one of the members of Surface, he lost his sight to a disease. He has cone, cone. Uh, and they all boost my rapid. brother in terms of energy and spirit. And it's funny because you ask that it galvanized. You you know, like my brother said, you know who, what you're made of and who is in your corner, who's not. You know, my wife Michelle. You know, uh, she was there. You know, every step of the way. You know, in terms of you know sleeping at, at Sloan Kettering and overnight, and my family, my sister Yvette, my children, Paul and and Symphony. Everybody just gave that energy, that transfer, breeze, sa. And it's about transferment of energy. It's a, it blows my mind the way people leave that out of the equation. Right. Right. Never do and that. And you man. don't forget yeah. your son PJ, my daughter yeah, Lakaya, yeah, 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 and Lou Star, and yeah. BB. So, you know, yeah. it's a whole family affair, a whole we, family we, support We don't want to plug everybody, yo, but no, you get Brandon. it. Now you'll hit me kill my two sons, B.B. and Brandon. Right, B.B. Right. and Brandon. <laughs> when is this Full Force you, movie coming? Story, when is this Full <laughs> Force movie coming? Well, you know, it's funny. That's in the talks. You know, right now, you know, I was speaking to uh, one of the guys, my man Terrence Takim. You guys may have known him. He was up here with 
Cordy on the phone that we co-produced called Jason's Letter. Mm -hmm. So he's got some strong interest from a guy that wants to do the full force story. That's, yeah, that's a documentary. Yeah, yeah. and it's that coming. Was so it's Another coming. film project, we're yeah. working with uh, Ed Martin and Ozzy Aru, which Ozzy Aru is from Aru Studios in Atlanta, which is Tyler Perry's old studio. And um, we're going to be working with them as well. So, um, you know, we're just doing that. No, this is good because I don't feel like your story is properly Word. being told, man. Yeah, Appreciate it. It's like a Broadway play, too, with all Absolutely. the musical. No. Yeah. I can see yeah, the full yeah, force yeah. music. Musical. Got a lot more to do, man. <laughs> no, we we, lot we lot appreciate do. you guys for joining us. Hey, Word, man. Thank Yo, you man. I'm a, I'm a big Legends, fan of all y'all. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. And individually. Thank, Thank you so much, man. Absolutely. All right. Well, what can they reach y'all, if anything? Oh, yeah. Um, well, me, uh, the real Paul Anthony on my IG, um, PA Live Life Dash Home for the Paul Anthony Foundation. I'm doing speaking engagements to touch lives, you know, men and women. Uh, that's the best way you can reach me, definitely. And mine is uh, hopewithavision.org. That's V I Z I O N.org. And my my site is, uh, you know, Bowlegged Lou, Lou George on Facebook and Instagram, the Bowlegged One. And um, the, and the most important one that force. it lifts out is Full Force. <laughs> <laughs> full Force. Yeah. And B, you have right. that thing too, right? Yeah, but you can reach Full Force through the Full Force World. And our name is on every one platform Full Force on IG and uh, Facebook and. Full force. All right. What's one more thing? Oh, 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 how can I forget? I got to shout out Christina Clark, who's the media management and communications for us, mm -hmm. and her assistant over there, Sandy, that just reminded us. And Sandy was picking her nose a lot in the lobby. <laughs> but, um, Come on, so, don't I forget saw, that. Saw, and, 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 and check this out. And check this out. I'm just, I just want to say that I was born in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, mm -hmm. and I just found out that Charlemagne also comes from one of the oh, islands. Yeah. Which one is that? He does? Rikers. Okay. Oh. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and, uh, and let me just say one last thing. I, I, I got I got a text for you guys there. Please, brothers, be proactive. My, 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 my lions, my generals, my kings, be proactive with yes. your health. Wow. Yes. Yes. Your life is very short. You know, with me, it's not this or that. It's this and that. You know, I did, I did acupuncture, circular breathing, whatever works for you. I have a company right now called Punch the Edibles. They, they believe in medicinal and regular cannabis. You know, there's so many things. Whatever works for you, do it. Don't wait. And let's honor our queens, you know, because they're the foundation. We got to feed each other. Okay, so that's important. Did that important. acupuncture help you? Yeah, yeah, because it opened up the chambers. So now, because oxygen is cancer's worst nightmare. So as it opened up the chambers and relaxed, it allowed me to breathe better. And I was focused on dealing with the chemo even more than the cancer. You understand? Because cancer is big business. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. So, right. yeah, it opened up a lot and relaxed me and it got me prepared along with a lot of herbs and things of that nature. The only thing it does with Paul, he passes gas a lot. I know Charlemagne's been getting fucked up right now, but <laughs> he farts a lot, but it's all good. All right. Round right. 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 of applause, man. Get full force, they flowers, man. Thank you. Full force. Yes, yes. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.